welcome to DroneCast, Rethinking Public Safety One Drone at a Time, a podcast by DroneSense. We explore real-world applications of drones in emergency response, offering a close examination of evolving trends in drone technology and its impact on public safety. I'm your host, John McLeod, Director of Customer Success here at DroneSense. Hello, and welcome to DroneCast. I'm your host, John McLeod. Today, I'm excited to introduce Jack Venables, an esteemed figure in British law enforcement, with a remarkable focus on countering drone threats. Jack's career reflects a deep-rooted commitment to innovation and proactive policing. With a keen understanding of both the operational and technological landscapes, Jack brings invaluable insights into the integration of cutting-edge counter-drone measures within law enforcement. Join us as we explore Jack's insights into the latest advancements, the strategic implications of drone technology, and his vision for ensuring airspace security in an area of rapid technological change. Welcome, Jack. We're really glad to have you today. Thank you for having me and flattered. Thank you. Really appreciate that. All right. Well, as we get started, I always like to kind of orientate the listener to you. So what interested you in a career in law enforcement? I joined the police quite young. I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's nice to feel like you can make a difference, um, particularly when it comes to protecting those more vulnerable than ourselves. I don't want to change the mood of the podcast, but it is quite, it's quite a dark world. I have an interest in technology and how technology can be practically applied to further our objectives within the, the public sector, the police. Drones and counter drones are arguably one of the biggest advancements in the police's technological arsenal this generation has seen. And I'm really proud to be a small cog in that this huge machine that's making this reality. Fantastic. I think you kind of introed me into my next question, which was kind of the intersection of technology and policing. Policing in some t- sometimes can be a very traditional field in a lot of ways for very good reasons. And technology is always moving. It's fragile at the edges. And so inherently, there's a little bit of contrast in there. What got you excited about technology within policing per se? So like you say, the, the applications are, are broad. And I think particularly, I mean, it's probably the same in the private sector in terms of expenditure, but in the public sector, every sort of penny we spend, we've got to be able to justify with the communities that we're there to protect, the events that we're there to protect. So it's a constant sort of to and fro in of what's, what does proportionality look like versus what are the needs of that very specific police operation or what are the needs of the, what does business as usual actually look like? So take us through a little bit. We introduce a little bit here in terms of your work in counter drone in particular. Can you talk us through a little bit about what a day or a week looks like? How does that play out in your profession? Yes, yeah, so first and foremost, that this sits within public safety. So to some extent, I would almost say it's a misnomer to say counter drones. As you can probably tell, I'm a huge advocate for drones. Most of the practitioners in this world are huge advocate for the, the safe and sort of responsible employment of drones. And there's some amazing, amazing applications of drone technology that, you know, without doubt, saving lives all around the globe. You could probably divide my working day into four distinct elements. So team managing, that's ensuring that the team have what they need to fulfill their role effectively, ensuring their welfare and training needs are met, and ensuring that they're all able to complete their duties in line with the expectations. Probably secondary to that would be forward planning organizations for pre-planned events. So some events call for police assistance. As I mentioned before about proportionality, sometimes we look at those requests, we look at the threat on those events, and we try to work out what proportionality looks like. Is it necessary to have certain mitigation? So part of my role is events will come in, it will be assessing, is this required for this event? If it is, what does that requirement look like? What does the threat to that event look like? What's the current intelligence? What resources do we have available? There's an awful lot, as you can imagine, liaising with partner agencies. So Civil Aviation Authority, we have nearby military sites. It's relative to America. There's military sites dotted all over the UK, as I'm sure it's the same in America, but we have aerodromes, military sites here there, and everywhere. We need to be sort of remain cognizant, or part of my role is remaining cognizant to have minimal impact on their business as usual. We do, well, I do site surveys, assessments to see where drones are likely to take off from. We build tactical plans to effectively mitigate against any aerial threat. And then third, probably reactive. 
So come in, come on duty or some point throughout my shift, a report of a nefarious drone or a near miss involving an uncrewed aircraft. And I'll have a look at that and see how me and the team can best investigate that matter and what risks that might pose to the public. So obviously in the case of manned aviation, commercial aircraft or military aircraft, obviously those implications are huge and we need to look at how we can avoid that happening again and how we can sort of appropriately investigate it and thoroughly investigate that matter. And finally, probably stakeholder engagement. I say stakeholder because it's not just the public. As you and a lot of your listeners will know, this is a rapidly evolving technology. We've seen huge legislative changes in the UK in the past few years. So I try and try and engage with other officers, improve their confidence in in the sort of the application of the legislation, their use of the legislation. And I also do a lot of work to educate the community. So the last thing we want is people scared to use their personal drone. I just want to ensure that people are mindful and drone u- users remain responsible and considerate of the effect that, that that drone can have on the community. So be mindful of uninvolved persons, temporary restrictions, proximity to flight paths, ongoing emergency responses, and even just simple deconfliction. Fantastic. Since you bring it up, one of the things that I have observed about policing in the UK using drones is what I have noticed is many of the agencies have done a particularly good job of engaging with stakeholders the way you're describing, particularly the public, to destigmatize the use of police using technology. For people who are earlier in their program, they're just getting started. Do you have any advice to give them in terms of what's the best way to engage with the public you found or what things have been successful that you would recommend? Yes, yeah, so the public, this community, and I found the vast majority of drone users are really professional, they're really responsible. And I think opening those channels of engagement early are what helps you sort of build those relationships with people. It's like any other business. I mean, the world of some of the police operations necessitates a degree of discretion or there's protected elements. But what we found is we've had public events, or I've managed public events before with this specialism, and we found that it's relatively unique in terms of, I've not seen it before in other specialisms within the police, but we find that the sort of the rogue, maybe naive drone user will fly near to a restricted airspace or near to a an event, a pre-planned event, and what we see is that if we engage with the the media over that, that positive action that the, the police took, is that when you look at the comments, you find that there's an awful lot of people who are very pro-drone who are actually quite sort of damning of the reckless or the in, the actions of that individual. And I think it's really interesting because obviously the, certainly in the UK, we base a lot of our policing on the Peelian principles, which you know, dates back to Robert Peel, the the founder of the police, and that's about representing the community we serve. And I, I think in this specialism, it's nice that, one, that we have that relationship with the public and those sort of good drone users, those professional drone users, and two, that that's a two-way relationship. We also have that sort of mutual support, and they sort of help the police in operation by way of, if it becomes the norm that people act responsibly, more people act responsibly, if it becomes, the, you know, if a community sort of, closes and says that's irresponsible that does a much better job than most police officers as individuals could do and it's about working together with the community so yes it's really good and i think my advice to anyone would be that you open those channels of engagement as soon as you can and have confidence in your communities because i think you'd be pleasantly surprised well that's incredibly well said and you're doing the most difficult thing in the world which is reading the comments always which can sometimes be a mixed bag so Kudos to you for taking that feedback from the community of all stripes as well. You alluded to earlier, drone technology is among the bleeding edge technologies in the world right now, artificial intelligence and drones. And there's several other kind of buzzwords we use in there, but it is really true about drones. I mean, very often you will order a piece of hardware and before you receive it, the new version's already been announced. The capabilities are really growing. The prices are dropping. It moves very quickly. How did you learn about drone technology and how do you keep up with that just rapidly evolving space? I learned about it by sort of personal experience. So just by virtue of the where I was working at the time, it came into my sort of professional world. In terms of keeping up, I mean, you've raised some really good points. I mean, just in the time I've been in this role, we've seen huge advancements in range, battery life, all cap 
payload. I mean, the Skycart's just been advertised or is now starting to be advertised. It's, we're seeing huge developments. And I think it's a real balance for the public sector at large, but specifically for the police, because we have to justify, as I said before, every penny we spend. Unfortunately, we can't always have the newest, best equipment, but massive guidance to other managers in that field or other specialists in that field would be that you always remain cognizant of what is available on the market. You remain cognizant and aware of those changes that are coming in and also those demands on your organization because some things are obviously always going to be better. For example, better battery life. Yes, that's great. It means that we can spend more time in the sky than we can downtime. But some things you can, okay, we don't need necessarily need to spend tens of thousands of pounds to invest in that very unique specialism. So it, it, again, it's about balance and proportionality, I would say. Yeah, and you make a good point. We all, I try to be, or are called to be in public safety, good fiduciaries of the public purse as well. Is there a particular feature set that's out now or that you see coming in the near future in the technology that gets you excited in particular that you see a great application for in your work? Yeah, so I mean, if we look globally, it's an arms race. There's no other term for it. So tomorrow this answer could be completely differently, but one of the coolest things I'm seeing at the minute is the STL's radio frequency direct energy weapon. So they're, they're calling it the drone killer. Uh, that's, that's how it's been publicly dubbed. It's public fit information, so feel free to Google it, look it up. But it, it's reported to be able to take out a drone swarm at a distance of one kilometer. And they're, they're saying at the minute it costs 10 p a shot. So it's still in development. And I'm proud to say that it's, it's British technology, so... I can't say I'd want to be the <laughs> operator of it, but yeah, I'm excited and I think that's got great potential. And, I, and it'd be nice. We see, we do see this in military technology can take years to come through to sort of city street and it gets, it has to go through all kinds of rigorous testing and make sure it has to become appropriate. And that's why I say tomorrow the answer could be completely different. But at the minute we look at things like that and it looks like a, that would be quite a, a good fix, but we'll see. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges you guys face in terms of navigating regulations around technology and drones in particular? Yeah, so I can say with confidence that from personal experience, every drone team I've experienced up and down the country are conscious of personal safety. The rules that govern them, and they are very professional. I work really closely with the CAA, the Civil Aviation Authority, in its simplest form, the UK version of the FAA. We're all progressing in this together. As you touched on before, John, this world is moving so rapidly. The legislation is changing quickly. We're seeing a few sort of big individuals in this world, but generally speaking, everybody is going through the same process of we are learning to deal with these new technology, new legislation, new demands on our daily business. And we're going through that together. So I'm really proud of certainly a lot of the drone team. I'm really lucky and fortuitous because my role has meant that instead of being in one small geographical area, I've seen quite a number of drone teams and counter drone teams up and down the United Kingdom. And I'm really, really sort of like humbled by some of the great work that's going on and, and the professionalism on, on show. There is no cutting corners. Everyone's proud and really sort of grateful to be in that world. You look at the, the National Police Chiefs Council here in the UK, there's some great work going on there. There's, there's a dedicated team. They do some brilliant work up and down the country. The College of Policing, we all help each other and it's mutually beneficial. That that help isn't just a benefit to say, I have to go and speak to or go and speak to someone Civil Aviation Authority. I'm learning from that exchange, but also those individuals are potentially learning from my own experiences. So, I mean, I would say for police officers, it's not really a specialism that you would just fall into. You'd have to jump through a few hoops to get to that stage. So they're all protective of their statuses on their teams. I don't know if this is shocking to you, but we don't have beyond visual line of sight in this country at the minute. So even for emergency responders, we don't have BV loss. You know, I think, again, this is something we will see in the future. I'm really confident, you know, optimistic that will be on our horizon. But yeah, that would bring about it could potentially save a lot, save more lives. And I'm not just talking about the public, save colleagues' lives as well. Uh, if we could launch beyond visual line of sight from a remote location and first respond using a drone as opposed to a human being. I mean, hopefully that's sooner than, than we think when we look at things like active shooters or serious road traffic collisions or reports of chemical, biological radiation, nuclear incidents. And there's some, there's some great work from 
some academics in this field as well. I, I know Dr. Anna Jackman and Luca Trent, so they're doing some great work in that field. So, yeah, I, I'm excited about the prospect of that. I'm I'm confident that the teams I've experienced, which I'd be here all day if I had to name them all, but those teams, you would trust them with this new technology. They are professional, they're diligent, genuinely, they're, they're what the public would want. The kind of changes within visual line of sight, beyond visual line of sight regulations, all kind of fall into this conversation that's different in different geographies, of course, but which is the multiple constituencies that are using a national airspace. We've got civil aviation, we have military aviation, we have public safety. Deconflicting that airspace and keeping it safe is critically important for safety in our communities. Perhaps it's an unsung need sometimes because we take it for granted when we don't see something terrible happen. But talk to us a little bit about how we work or what's the right thing to do when we're thinking about how do we keep our airspace safe for all those different constituent users, considering drone users in that space as well, too. Yeah, so, I mean, for me personally, we collaborate a lot with the military. We collaborate with emergency services, airfields, even local flying clubs. And in the main, that's face-to-face meetings because, in my opinion, you want to build those relationships with individuals. I'm really conscious that I can't be the expert in everything, so it's nice to have that network of professionals that you can approach and you can ask for help if need to be. I know where to go when, for example, I need an expert on the military application of drones. That's never going to be me, but it would be somebody in the military. So in its purest form, I suppose, it's you know the obvious example is responding to an emergency incident. You know, the emergency services have their priorities first and foremost. That's usually the preservation of life. Imagine the scene of a serious road traffic collision. There's a variety of casualties at scene being treated. Some of those are in critical condition. The air ambulance is inbound and some of the emergency responders are complaining about a drone overhead. This drone is flown by a third party trying to obtain pictures to sell onto news outlets. The best case scenario is a distraction for the practitioners, giving critical life support. Obviously, worst case scenario, the drone unknowingly impedes the path of the air ambulance, delaying the medical intervention, or the drone even collides with the police or the fire drone engaged at the scene. They both fall into the chaos, contributing further to the, the risk to life and compromising the integrity of the ensuing investigation. I think that is a great example of where that, what necessitates that collaboration. That's why we do it really well. We do do it quite well. We collaborate really well with emergency services. I would say to all other professional sort of air users that if you have that invitation or that sort of, if someone reach out, reaches out to you, that you engage with those, whoever it may be, because nine times out of 10, it's going to be to make your life easier as well. And we've had it where we've had to liaise with heliports on a private, privately run event. And I think when that first contact is made, the manager of the heliport might think, oh, this looks like a problem. Actually, we're there to deconflict. We're there to make their life easier. We want that. We're not there to hinder their business. We're there to protect that event and what they do day to day. You know, you kind of alluded to this, which is we have multiple disciplines within the public sector who have to work together in an interagency sense, provide mutual aid, because there's just more things than one person can ever know. And But as a composite, we can do really great work. Collaboration is also very hard. There's a lot of different personalities involved. What have you found that's worked well? And do you have any tips for people who need to learn how to collaborate with multiple agencies that you found effective? Yes, I'd say, as I sort of touched on before, that for me, it's face-to-face. I find that those face-to-face meetings, you build that rapport with individuals, and it, and it is individuals. You know, we're talking about huge in organizations, but all of those huge organizations have a handful of individuals that sort of exist in that world. So when we look at, for example, deconfliction, you know, personally, I, I can call upon examples whereby I've invited those stakeholders into a an office for the duration of that pre-planned event. So then those individuals are privy to that decision-making process they can add and contribute information and intelligence lifetime. They also see the understanding in, or the reason that the police have stopped or done this or that whatever they've done, they can see that process. They can see it and they can also contribute to it. So I think being privy to it helps people understand. And I think when they see what we do day to day, and it's not always possible, I will say that there is obviously times where the nature of the operation is sensitive or whatever, but where we can, and I'm not, I am speaking for everyone in this world here, and I'm very conscious of that, but where we can, we always invite and encourage those people to 
be with us to see how we operate, to see how we work and to help us because we need their help. It's a two-way street. So, yeah, and we're all out for the same reason. You know, we're all out to maintain the integrity of the airspace. So. Fantastic. When you think about the challenges you're encountering today, I know you, you spend a lot of time planning and working through those, but if you look ahead a little bit, are there specific challenges you're starting to see coming to into being that you're starting to think about? How do I protect the public against those things? Like, what's the next horizon of challenges that you kind of see coming towards us? Yeah, so the, the next big challenge, in my opinion, for counter drones is when the drones themselves become critical infrastructure. So we're already aware of retail giants like Amazon and Walmart using drones for deliveries. Extrapolate that by like five to 10 years and there's likely be lanes of drones in the sky. And then when organized criminality start mirroring that infrastructure to deliver their contraband, that's when we have real complex issues on our hands. Counter drone specialists will have to surgically impact a nefarious drone to minimize disruption to critical supply chains. Um, and the other issue is that the public also become numb to drone flight, so they stop reporting things to the police and things like it's, again, public information, but it's evidence that sometimes the criminal fraternity are using drones to conduct reconnaissance runs before doing things like acquisitive crime, you know, burglaries and whatnot. So when people become numb to it, that, that presents another challenge. Again, I'd mentioned before some great work, but there's an individual in this country and they are a, an ethical engineer. Now they've sort of reverse engineered a drone to carry medical supplies to remote islands where they don't have huge hospitals or that again is saving lives but that's where i talk about that is critical infrastructure and if the nefarious drone was to imitate or mirror that's when it starts to present some sort of real issues for us because we need to ensure that we are remain vigilant and we remain capable whether that be the change in technology or, or resources or whatever but we re remain able to sort of mitigate against that the other big challenge is the when we talk about things changing because of technology is the increase in the range of drones and it seems inevitable given the growth that we've seen today but that will call for even more streamlined and effective collaboration between civil authorities like the police that we've seen today so you know i've talked here about the great relationships that to be fair within the united kingdom albeit it's all geographical police forces we all sort of work well together we all have that great collaborative system I, i've never i genuinely have never I've been in the police for coming on 15 years now. I've never dealt with a specialism like this where people work so well together and, and not just within individual police forces nationally. We're going to see that when these ranges change, we're going to have to see things like, you know, UK police forces working well with other nation state civil authorities. And that's a huge issue on the horizon and something that I am conscious of. We often see in the policy space, sometimes our capabilities with technology front run our ability to ask the question of how we should use technology or how do we create structure around it for safety. So do you see also people in line with the challenges you're foreseeing working in the policy space, the technology space to give you tools and apparatus to help maintain public safety in the future as well? Yeah, so that's, again, there's a lot, of, a lot of good work going on with the Civil Aviation Authority and they are working. There's been, if you look at the last probably 10 years, there's been some huge legislative changes. And those pieces of legislation that brings into law certain elements, it's really sort of, that process is quite slow and difficult and it takes a lot of time and has to go through, rightfully so, has to go through a, a huge process. Then there's a sort of reaction to that change in legislation, which comes from the likes of the police and civil aviation authority. And so every time those changes come about, it prompts sort of a, a review, probably for want of a better word. And we're lucky, with, certainly within the police, we have the National Police Chiefs Council who have, they've invested in a dedicated counter drones team. So that's like a relatively small team of specialists who help up and down the country with the offer guidance. They can help out with equipment. Those guys are really good. But yeah, it's, there is definitely challenges there and, and keep it up is a huge part of our business area. I think it's often overlooked because people see, or some people see a drone as a drone, and that people in the know will see that how quickly those that technology is changing, how quickly it's advancing, and therein how quickly those that threat changes and how different that mitigation has to be. So it's a constantly moving piece of work and it's massive, it's very demanding. We talk to a lot of communities, particularly across Europe, who are recognizing 
the risk and rewards of both drone technology and public safety and also the need for counter drone technology and mitigations as well. And some of them are realizing they're a little bit behind the game a little bit, and they're starting to stand up new programs. And it's a lot to get started. I mean, there's just a lot of things to consider. There's a lot of work to do it well. For people who are beginning that process where they have a lot to do in a small amount of time, what advice would you give them in terms of starting a program or what should they be thinking about to be successful? So resilience, you're going to come across some challenges, you're going to come across a degree of apathy, I'm sure. But, you know, stay motivated, stay concentrate on your mission that you set out. Because I'm sure if it's within the, certainly within the policing world, that motivation, that mission will be around protecting the vulnerable. Utilize resources. There is loads of people in this field, loads of specialists, officers that can help you reach out to them. You don't necessarily have to be in your same jurisdiction or geographical area to reach out and ask for help. Likewise, I've found academia. There's a lot of academics who do have done a lot of research in this field and they will help out quite significantly. They can present you with facts and figures and whatnot to approach those the people who, who control the purse, for example, and help you with that, that objective. I think it's not necessarily an easy job. I'm personally quite proud. I was in a, a Northern Police Force and I stood up the counter UAS capability from nothing. It, it, there wasn't one at the time when I sort of established it. We went through exactly what I've just described. There was support from some individuals, a degree of apathy from other individuals, but we got there. I'm really proud of the team in that force and I'm sure some of them may or may not be listening to this, but the UK's counter UAS policing community is something to be proud of. Every single one of them have worked hard to be where they are. That team in the north, we built it from nothing and every one of them was really can do. And in the most part, I get the impression that they took a leap of faith on my passion for the specialism. They're a great bunch and I'm, I'm really proud of the personal achievements there, but that would be nothing without the team. Just anecdotally, I remember, and this is probably crucial for somebody who's just about to embark on a huge mission of standing up this mitigation, but there was a moment where I was stood on a, a rooftop overlooking a northern city's like, skyline during a police operation last year. And we'd been really busy on the run-up to the event and we'd faced hurdle after hurdle, but we'd allowed ourselves this like small moment of gratitude and appreciating what we'd done and how we'd got to that point. Everything could come together. And with this almost like movie-like backdrop, the sun sets on the waterfront of the city. And it just felt like we'd achieved so much. And I'm super grateful for that team. I'm super grateful for all the support that I've had nationally and people have helped out with bits and bobs. And it, like, as I say, there's too many to detail here. But my the overwhelming sentiment of that is that if there was a, almost a header for this, it would be probably about collaboration. And it would be about knowing when to put your hand up and say, how's this been done before? If it hasn't been done before, what does this look like? What help is available? And having the confidence to ask for that help. Awesome. I mean, those are all the big questions I have for you today. And so usually this is the time in the podcast. I, I pass the microphone back to you. If there's something you'd like to shamelessly plug or highlight that you're working on, we'd love to hear about it. No, sadly, no, I've not got anything to plug. But yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn if you want to reach <laughs> out directly. But yeah, no, unfortunately, I've not got anything to plug. So Well, fantastic. Well, Jack, thank you so much for taking time to visit with today and share your insight. You obviously are incredibly sophisticated in what you do. And so hearing directly from somebody like you, I know means a lot to our listeners. So I thank you for investing some time with us today. And thanks to everyone who's listening on the internet and for listening to DroneCast. We will see you next time. DroneCast, rethinking public safety one drone at a time is brought to you by DroneSense. To find out more about DroneSense and how our comprehensive situational awareness platform can help you fly, share, and manage your drone program, please visit dronesense.com. That's D-R-O-N-E-S-E-N-S-E.com. And then make sure to search for DroneCast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else that podcasts are found. Please don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at DroneSense, thanks for listening.